Hello, hello. If everybody could please take their seats. It's, um, I realize I am, I am no Ralph Michaels, but I am determined to keep us running roughly on time. So um, it's almost, it's approximately 8.30, so I think we'll um, get underway. Um, again, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is John Coyle. I'm a professor over at um, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I'm delighted to be chairing uh, the panel today. Uh, the format will be the same as it was yesterday. Each panelist will speak for 20 minutes. I have the um, cell phone of death ready there next to them so they know exactly how much time they have. And um, after that, we'll have hopefully a nice, uh, vigorous uh, question and answer period. So I'm going to go sit back down. And I think that uh, Linda, I believe you're first up. And I think Linda's going to do it uh, from sitting down as well. So I'll go back over there. for uh, the invitation and really to the students, um, all the help and work that you've done on this to make this possible, including all this wonderful transportation, which is really quite unusual for somebody who comes from New York. And we have a conference, and we let you fend for yourselves. Good luck. Um, so it's been very much appreciated. Um, and in particular, the credit um, for this symposium, everyone said it, and the insights um, about the role of um, the international transnational case for sort of thinking about the redrafting of the restatement goes, of course, to uh, Professor Michaels. And I uh, talked to Ralph about this sort of last May at the annual ALI meeting when we had a sort of brief uh, conversation about whether conflict of laws rules sort of broadly defined should be shaped any differently for the cross-border case. And I have to say my first instinct was that the, the rules are not going to look any different for contracts and torts and so on, and except I said maybe a few very, very specific areas, so I don't see any reason necessarily that the reporters have to sort of turn to all of this. Uh, and he said to me, well, what examples can you think of? And you know, I went for the obvious one first, um, recognition of judgments, but everybody knows that, and then the legislative jurisdiction issues that uh, Trey and Hannah talked about, but those are being taken up um, in the foreign relations restatement, so you know they will want to look there. And then I thought, well, there might be some areas governed by treaty, and that will obviously call for it. But then I sort of said, well, there might be some other more nuanced areas. I think they're small, but um, and uh, I referred, as one often does, to something that I had written um, a long time ago on the Asahi case, where um, I said maybe there was a different standard for. Uh, judicial uh, jurisdiction. And so Professor Michaels sort of decided to take this to a much more uh, comprehensive uh, stage, and that's this interesting conference, which is looking both at these cross-border issues and the comparative issues. So I'm really going to talk about it from the domestic versus the transnational case. And I uh, have on my agenda, if I get that far, sort of two areas where I think the transnational case, like the, the cross-border case, uh, may deserve uh, special attention and where um, conflict rules might distinguish. Now, one of those areas, and I, I don't want to step on Richard because he's going to talk more about it. One of them is party autonomy and um, the international case. And um, if I have time, I'll say a word about that. The second one is the role of judicial jurisdiction under the due process clause. And I think that's um, a little more no, nuanced. And let me say at the f outset that um, I respect the basic proposition that we've talked about it here, that the purpose of a restatement is to restate the law and not make it up um, in order to develop rules that we think or one thinks are desirable as a matter of uh, policy. And at the same time, um, having worked uh, as an advisor to various restatements, I do think that um, the restatements in the past and the present ones uh, try to reflect trends in the law and perhaps adopt principles. The, the term was used at the recent uh, meeting on the restatement of commercial arbitration to give the law a progressive nudge, and that was where the term. So let me say, it, what about judicial jurisdiction? And I'm going to focus on just one aspect of it, and that's the reasonableness. Is there a difference in the transnational versus the the interstate case? So it's true that in the uh, almost 30 years since the Asahi decision, um, the lower courts have defined the due process standard for specific jurisdiction. I'm talking right now just about specific jurisdiction. In the same fashion for domestic and transnational cases. If you read cases, 
um, whether the defendant is domestic or foreign, first we say, are there sufficient contacts? And then we say, um, is there reasonableness? And that sort of two-step process was really um, set forward that way in Asahi, and it was kind of a break from the earlier way of looking uh, at uh, minimum contacts and fairness. So when I teach it, I say it used to be um, minimum contacts and fairness, and now it's minimum contacts. And then if you satisfy that, you go uh, to reasonableness. So um, sometime after the Asahi uh, decision, um, I noted that this two-step process uh, had uh, operated that way. And um, I said, um, I thought the few cases um, that rejected jurisdiction on the second ground after finding those reckless contacts fit the comedy concerns of Asahi that when there was a foreign defendant. So my instinct at that time with, I would say, only very impressionistic um, results rather than any kind of empirical research was that the due process judicial jurisdiction standard was different when we were dealing with foreign defendants than when we had uh, domestic uh, defendants, and that um, that multi-prong analysis was really used, had weight only in those cases. And you know, there's some, there was some uh, support for that view. Um, the introductory note to section 421 of the restatement third um, of foreign relations on uh, jurisdiction to adjudicate, which uh, came out after Asahi was decided. Um, the introductory note says, um, this restatement sets forth some international rules and guidelines for the exercise of jurisdiction to adjudicate in cases having international implications applicable to courts both in the United States and in other states. Now, whether this is really a principle of international law, um, I think it's not so clear. Um, Andy Lowenfeld thought it was, and I'm not sure I do, so he would be happy with me again. Um, but the other comment was the jurisdiction to adjudicate and jurisdiction to prescribe. Um, the comment under that says, this section applies the principle of reasonableness to limit the exercise of jurisdiction to adjudicate as section 403 does with respect to jurisdiction to prescribe. And I think um, Professor Lowenfeld, who was the architect of those sections, really saw this as the analog to the 403 uh, balancing, and then it was really used in cross-border uh, cases. Now, it's fair to say that the U.S. cases pay now at least lip service to this contact reasonableness test in both interstate um, and um, transnational cases, whether it's foreign or domestic defendants. But again, since we're now involved in a revision of both the conflicts of laws restatement and the foreign relations restatement, I thought it was worth taking at least a more serious look at the data to determine whether um, the distinction that I thought might work um, does. And uh, to that end, um, I have a co-author, and that's my research assistant who has gathered up uh, many of these cases. I think it's a sample more than an exhaustive uh, data collection, but it's a survey of 400 judicial jurisdiction cases involving the decisions on reasonableness since the year 2000. And the attempt was to try to capture uh, the law. And um, the survey shows that courts in practice only dismiss on reasonableness grounds when the defendant is foreign and almost never dismiss in interstate on, uh, cases on grounds of reasonableness, although you'll see the reasonableness line, lip service, as I call it, uh, discussed. Now, that is not to say that most foreign defendants in cases of specific jurisdiction are dismissed on reasonableness grounds. Indeed, in those foreign defendant cases, and Trey asked me, he said, how many actually are there? And I went back, and um, it's about 150 of the 400 cases where you get minimum contacts. Um, they're, they're satisfied. But, uh, so only one quarter uh, of those cases are dismissed on reasonable, reasonable grounds. But it's only in basically the foreign defendant cases where reasonableness is even given serious uh, consideration. And so you know, I think it is the kind of comedy uh, concern. So let me just say a word about the cases where courts do dismiss. Um, one begins with Asahi, which is uh, unusual on its facts, and it had this fractured opinion. Um, 
students, I know you know this case, uh, and so I don't have to say anything about it. Um, uh, the liability claim against the Taiwanese defendant manufacturer, and it was only uh, jurisdiction uh, on the indemnity claim, the Taiwanese manufacturer against the Japanese component manufacturer that was at issue there. Um, and uh, because there was a 4-4 split on whether or not there were minimum contacts, whether putting a product into the stream was sufficient, uh, eight of the justices went on to address the reasonableness of the uh, assertion of jurisdiction. Justice Scalia wanted nothing to do with reasonableness. He said he said there were no contacts, and that was the end of the matter. And uh, again, um, the uh, court talked about things that are uh, directed at a foreign defendant, the distance between Japan and California, the burdens of a defendant submitting to a foreign legal system, uh, a claim between f two foreign manufacturers, again, a little bit of conflicts law uh, likely to be decided under foreign law, and that California really had uh, a diminished interest, at least, in hearing the case. And the court expressly mentioned um, the interest of other nations in foreign policies, and the quotation, great care and reserve should be exercised when extending our notion of personal jurisdiction into the international field. So, as I said, we find that the reasonableness inquiry leads to dismissal primarily uh, when there is a foreign defendant. Now, I've got to qualify that claim um, because um, the reasonableness test, if you look at the Asahi factors, takes into account the interests of the forum state and the interest of the plaintiff in attaining relief. And so in personal injury cases involving foreign manufacturers where products injure U.S. consumers and where minimum contacts are found, and I'll just say a word about minimum contacts in a minute, um, courts essentially never dismiss except in a case which looks like Asahi, where for some reason the plaintiff drops out of um, the proceedings. Um, you might have thought that after McIntyre, um, the, the tort cases that satisfy minimum contacts would have dropped off considerably. But given that very fractured opinion, if you look at the lower cases, most of them have uh, decided that um, McIntyre should be understood by the uh, um, Alita Breyer uh, opinion, which said, on our view, there's only one product in the record. And so that allows courts to really distinguish the post-McIntyre uh, cases. But back to reasonableness. Um, so comedy factors, uh, I think, uh, give way to form interests when you have an injured uh, US plaintiff when the US party uh, is still there. Uh, outside of the tort cases, however, it's interesting. The presence of a foreign defendant, even in a suit brought by a U.S. plaintiff, does result um, in dismissal on reasonableness grounds. And I'll just give sort of one example here. Um, the case is a case called um, Benton versus Kamiko. Um, it's a 2004 case, a breach of contract suit brought in California by, a, sorry, Colorado by a Colorado plaintiff, which involved a failed joint venture. Uh, activities relating to the negotiation took place in Colorado, sufficient minimum contacts. Nonetheless, the Tenth Circuit says that the assertion of jurisdiction was not reasonable, noting that the defendant was, and here it's only a Canadian corporation, um, Canadian law would govern the dispute, again, a role for choice of law, and deference should be given to the international nature of the case. Um, um, so I think the case is representative uh, with respect to the reasoning and the type of fact pattern that um, we found in uh, our uh, sample. There are other cases, uh, but there's no reason to detail them uh, here. Um, the, what, what is interesting is the discussion about factors in these cases, like location of evidence and witnesses, um, are not directed to consideration of litigational convenience. And this is a little bit reminiscent of things that Hannah said yesterday about the way you think, and, and Trey said, the way you think about these cases. So they're not really the, we, where we see in the domestic cases litigational convenience, but rather about the element of uh, comedy. And I think it's that that makes them unique to foreign defendant cases. Um, I can say a, a, a brief word about the defendant cases, uh, that the foreign defendant cases that do not dismiss, the thing I would mostly say about them is that the, they have reasoning that's different 
um, from uh, domestic cases. Um, so in these cases, the courts try to ensure that foreign de defendants are able to obtain effective representation, and they talk about the availability of counsel and familiarity with the legal system. And then conversely, in those cases, they will talk about the fact that the US plaintiff um, in some of these cases would face the hardship of traveling to uh, a foreign country. And so it cuts um, the other way. And I think if one, again, analyzes these cases as we have tried to do, um, whether the plaintiff is the sort of little guy um, or a substantial corporation may be one of the factors. Um, if I have just a few more minutes, let me just say a word on general jurisdiction. It's hard not to say a word on general jurisdiction um, after the um, uh, Daimler case. Is that how much more time I have? Oh, OK. Uh, um, gee, that's a lot. Uh, um, so the survey that we did, the sample, was directed to cases of specific jurisdiction. Um, but Daimler um, you know, has certainly has to be seen as a comedy case in one sense, given what the court says about the transnational context of the dispute and the reasons. But um, uh, what they also did um, by changing the jurisdictional rule to require that the defendant be at home and then kind of limiting to the corporation's place of incorporation and principal place of business with maybe some exceptions, they reject uh, any role for reasonableness um, in general jurisdiction is basically unnecessary. Um, and um, I think Justice Ginsburg's opinion does focus and talk a lot about international comedy and avoidance of um, international friction. Now, of course, all of this, I was talking to Matias yesterday about this, it's all dicta. I mean, the Supreme Court actually took the case on uh, the role of the subsidiary, and they answer that question, and then they keep on writing um, and have created a whole host of problems. So, I mean, it's possible, but I think it's really very unlikely that lower courts will limit Daimler um, to a case involving a foreign defendant where the conduct occurred abroad. I mean, one could see Daimler in that way. Uh, there is a state Supreme Court um, that has actually uh, done just that. And again, I thank Trey, who brought this case to my attention. And uh, the Supreme Court of Montana, and that is the highest court in Montana, said that Daimler involved transnational injuries and parties incorporated overseas, and its holding did not apply to a case that arose in the United States. Um, they have some other comments about it being an FBLA case as well. A petition for cert has been filed. Um, but for the most part, um, Daimler is applied equally to the interstate situation. That is, a US defendant is held subject to general jurisdiction only in its state of incorporation and its uh, principal place of business. And um, in Daimler, the court actually refers expressly to sister state cases as well as uh, foreign country corporations because they're citing actually to um, uh, Goodyear. So um, what relevance do these findings have for specific jurisdiction and reasonableness for the restatement third of conflicts and uh, the restatement fourth of foreign relations law? There's already a tentative draft of provisions on jurisdiction in the draft foreign relations statements. Neither the black letter nor the comments highlight the very special role of reasonableness in the transnational case. And the black letter fails to give any guidance to what the standards are. And I have sent these comments on to the reporters. I think you know their position that they can say uh, jurisdiction is governed by state law and state statutes and due process. Um, uh, is a second layer that has to be satisfied is not really very helpful, uh, certainly to um, persons outside the United States who are trying to figure out, and I don't think it's really helpful for those of us inside the United States in trying to give um, some uh, guidance. As for the restatement of conflicts, which is really where we sit, um, the second restatement has over 50 sections, sections 24 to 77, relating to what I would call adjudicatory jurisdiction. There are always definitional problems. But then there are some additional sections in the restatement second that talk about limitations on the exercise of jurisdiction. Some of those look to me like subject matter jurisdiction limitations. I'm not really sure. There's also form non shows up in, you know, under the black letter um, of judicial jurisdiction. 
I don't think, but I have not really looked very hard, that these provisions are relied upon or cited much by uh, contemporary courts because they are outdated and the jurisprudence have moved on since 1971 when this was done. So in addition to the necessary updates that I know will have to be done, I think it would be prudent to draft provisions that call attention to the special role of the foreign defendant in the application of the due process test, particularly the reasonableness inquiry, whether that happens in the reporter's notes or in the comments, I think it would be a good idea. Um, I think maybe this survey has more relevance to the uh, foreign relation uh, restatement, and I intend to pass uh, those observations on uh, to them. Um, I have about one minute, right? 37 seconds, so I won't say anything, uh, except, to, uh, except to just say I do think when you move to party autonomy, there are, again, reasons to distinguish between the international uh, and the interstate uh, context. I think uh, the notion that of uh, this substantial um, relationship with the state um, uh, should be used in international contracts is wrong. I think we can take some things from the Supreme Court's decisions on choice of forum clauses uh, to read, for, to, to stand for a somewhat different standard on party autonomy, but I will hold that uh, until Richard finishes. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. <clears throat> Richard, on to you. Thank you very much. Um, my theme is party autonomy. Um, I want to begin, however, on a personal note, uh, just to thank um, Ralph and the elves, as they were described yesterday, uh, for all the wonderful organization. I should say, if one may sort of continue um, with that metaphor, I suppose this makes Ralph, as it were, the Gandalf of this um, operation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I need to say a few words by way of full disclosure, because I need to tell you that I come from a very different world in which the conflict of laws is, in fact, private international law, and thereby hangs a tail, uh, which is important for the purposes of our discussion today. I need to say something about the environment of private international law in my country, uh, so that you can make sense of what I'm saying. Um, and this really goes to the question of what is an international conflict. In my jurisdiction, in the United Kingdom, we have no internal conflicts. I mean, yes, there is more than one jurisdiction. <laughs> there is more than one jurisdiction, and Scotland remains part of the United Kingdom for the time being. But for all practical purposes, our conflicts are international. Not only are they international, but by and large, for reasons that I will explain, our uh, private international law is driven by high-value, multi-state, complex commercial disputes, all of which happen in one location, in our commercial court in London. Um, so I begin from the proposition that the subject that I'm dealing with is essentially um, uh, concerned with international disputes. Um, it's also worth saying that for that reason, I think, the English experience, this is not the European experience, this is the English experience, is that uh, international conflicts disputes uh, really revolve around two particular species of dispute. That's to say, the international disputes that we have are either the major commercial disputes that I've been describing, or they are substantial class actions involving foreign environmental torts um, and such like. Um, now, the reason uh, for the focus being on those two types of dispute is not insignificant. Cross-border litigation is very expensive. You will only be able to fund it if you are a large corporation, hence the commercial disputes, or if you are a class supported by a firm of lawyers which is essentially willing to underwrite the, the claim um, on a conditional fee basis. Cross-border disputes in the sense of international disputes, in my experience, never concern consumers or employees or insureds. They simply don't happen. I should say, by way of a footnote, that a recent study showed that despite the amount of effort and heat um, which is put into discussing uh, cross-border consumer disputes in Europe, they actually never happen because consumers will not sue across borders. So I'd like to make that initial point, that when you're talking about cross-border litigation in an international sense, you're really not talking about the whole gamut of choice of law 
issues or jurisdictional issues. You're talking about specific species um, of cases. Um, if I can turn then to my theme, I'm going to make a few remarks uh, against the background that I just sketched, both in relation to choice of law and jurisdiction. I want to emphasize jurisdiction for the reason I indicated yesterday. In my country, choice of law disputes never happen. All our cross-border disputes are jurisdictional. And let me say, I would venture to suggest that is also a feature of international litigation. It is in the nature of international litigation where the battle is a battle about forum and where the stakes are high and the costs are high that the tendency of uh, a dispute to settle once the jurisdictional issue has been resolved um, is very high indeed. In other words, the most important element in any treatment of international disputes is always going to be the jurisdictional question. Um, if we turn then to party autonomy, um, it is necessary to define what we mean by party autonomy because the expression itself doesn't necessarily express what I think we think about in relation to that concept. What it means to me as an English lawyer where basically every issue is ultimately a contractual issue. What we're talking about is respect for the intention of the parties. I say that because very often the question of party autonomy resolves itself into uh, the interpretation of contracts and working out precisely what it was that the parties meant in their governing law clause um, and their jurisdiction agreement. And let me say, you might think that it's easy enough to say what a jurisdiction agreement means or a governing law clause means, but it is not. If we agree in our contract that the contract shall be governed uh, by the laws in force in the state of utopia, do we mean by that to create a contractual obligation which may be sued upon in the event that it is broken? Or do we mean merely to declare what we think the governing law should be? And should there be a difference between those, that is ultimately a matter of interpreting the intentions of the parties. If the parties agree to the non-exclusive jurisdiction of the courts of utopia, what do they mean by that? You might think they mean by that that they can sue in utopia and they have complete freedom to sue anywhere else. Well, not according to our judges, because our judges have interpreted the parties' intentions in such cases as meaning, for example, that once proceedings have begun in the named court in a non-exclusive jurisdiction agreement, that forecloses the possibility of proceedings anywhere else because the parties could not possibly have intended parallel proceedings, even if they intended a degree of flexibility. I make that point because party autonomy involves close attention to the intentions of the parties usually expressed in a contract. My next point really is just to I think, to me, state the obvious, but I realize in conversations in the margins of this meeting, this is not necessarily the obvious uh, to everybody here. It seems to me that it is almost a foregone conclusion that party autonomy is a good thing, and if the parties agree to something in conflict of laws terms, to jurisdiction or choice of law, that that should be respected, come what may. That is a matter of fairness. It is a matter of giving effect to the expectations of the parties. But it is also because when parties insert into contracts, not just commercial contracts, but consumer contracts, and I mean that in a broad sense, insurance contracts, employment contracts, whatever, um, what they are doing, of course, is trying to limit the risk associated with litigation. The purpose of these contractual terms is to limit and define risk. It is about the allocation of risk. The reason why a governing law clause is important is because it tells the parties that law X will govern without a dispute. The reason why a jurisdiction agreement is important is because it removes litigation risk. But I want to emphasize here that this is not simply a feature of commercial contracts, B2B contracts. It is also a feature of contracts which involve an element of unequal bargaining power. It is to the benefit of a consumer that uh, a governing law clause or a jurisdiction agreement um, is respected because if the supplier knows that it will be, that defines the risk for the supplier and reduces the cost, the price um, of, the, um, of the product. I mentioned that point. Consumers, it is commonly assumed that consumers have something to lose if the stronger party's governing law clause is enforced. Well, they don't because if it isn't, then the price of the service or the goods will simply go up. The next preliminary point that I wanted to make, and let me say it looks as if, glancing at my watch, most of my points are going to be of a preliminary nature, 
is that it's very important when looking at what you might broadly call dispute resolution clauses, by which I mean clauses in contracts which comprise both governing law and jurisdiction elements, it is very important to distinguish between what you might call the promissory or the contractual effect of such terms and the declaratory or private international law effect of such terms. A governing law clause and a jurisdiction agreement, they both have double lives. That's to say, they tell a court whether to accept jurisdiction or they assist in the court's determination of jurisdiction, if it's a jurisdiction agreement, but they also, of course, give a party the opportunity to take advantage of contractual remedies in the event that the term is broken. That's to say, English law recognises the possibility of mounting an action for breach of contract if a jurisdiction agreement is broken, and of course the anti-suit injunctions that our courts so frequently grant uh, in order to enforce jurisdiction agreements are simply mechanisms for providing an injunction to prevent a breach of contract. If I can just <coughs> emphasize this point, it is perfectly sensible to me, although I think this rarely happens in practice, to imagine the following situation. The parties have agreed to the exclusive jurisdiction of the courts of New York. One party sues the other in England. It is possible, it is rare, but it is possible that the English court would decide to exercise jurisdiction, notwithstanding the existence of the New York jurisdiction agreement, because it may consider, exceptionally, that it is the natural forum for the dispute, notwithstanding the existence of that clause. That is a decision about jurisdiction. It is a private international law outcome. That, of course, does not prevent, in principle, uh, the uh, party uh, who has lost the jurisdictional dispute from then mounting an action for breach of contract, because if it's an exclusive jurisdiction agreement and it was broken, there is a contractual obligation which has been broken. I make that extreme example simply to show the distinction that I'm thinking of. My next point, really, is just to say that I take it, I mean, as, a, as an English lawyer who comes from what you might call a commercial private international law background, because that is what most of our private international law disputes are about, it seems to me to be an axiom that we need to give effect to party autonomy. We need to give effect to the party's legitimate uh, choices. And it seems to me that that is true, notwithstanding the fact that there may be some objective lack of connection, for example, between the chosen law um, and, the, um, and the parties um, or the dispute. I mean, it is, a, to me as an English lawyer, a strange notion to say that the parties can express a contractual choice and agree to the law of utopia, but then a judge can say they can't have the law of utopia because the law of utopia has no connection with their dispute. I would say that, wouldn't I? because in the English courts, a very substantial number of disputes concern contracts which are governed by English law. And that's an important consideration. When I think of governing law and jurisdiction, I think largely of jurisdiction agreements and governing law clauses in favor of my own jurisdiction. Well, if I put that in context, uh, yes, we have a large number of cases in our commercial court in particular where the parties have agreed to the jurisdiction of the English court and they have agreed to English law as the governing law. But it is very likely, indeed, that the circumstances of the case and the parties themselves will have no connection with England whatsoever. There is a famous statistic which startles those who are not familiar with the work of our commercial court, which is this. Something close to 80% of the cases in our commercial court involve at least one party which is not English. But the most striking figure is the other one. Something between 50 and 60% of cases involve disputes between parties, neither of which is English. It is not uncommon to have a dispute between two Russian companies concerning the ownership of uh, oil wells in Kazakhstan litigated in the English courts. So it's very unlikely that I would say that a choice of court or a, or a choice of law could be invalidated because of some lack of connection, because that would destroy the business of most of the large city law firms who litigate in this area. 
In the short time that I have available, I just wanted to make some observations, if I may, um, about the two areas which, which um, are within my brief. That's to say, party autonomy and the governing law, and party autonomy um, and jurisdiction. In relation to governing law, the point I think that I wanted to emphasize is this. It is a mistake to believe that a choice of governing law can occur only by means of a contractual term, a governing law clause. It is not uncommon uh, for parties who litigate, at least in my courts, to litigate a contract which might be governed by the law of some foreign country, but choose not to rely upon the law of that foreign country. Some of the most famous cases in the English law of contract, interestingly enough, concern situations uh, where the law governing the contract was actually that of another country. But of course, litigants are entitled to uh, avoid the application of foreign law. In the past, we have tended to think of this as a procedural matter, and indeed our courts do, and Dicey, Morris, and Collins, the great textbook, does, but then they would. The reality, however, is that since the advent of the European regulations, it is perfectly obvious that an omission to plead foreign law is to be viewed as a choice of law matter and amounts to a choice of the law of the um, forum. And it's important to... So, text for me, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was wondering why that gentleman was actually texting me, but I mean, anyway. Um, you have five minutes. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, and because of the, the enormous practical significance of the parties being able to affect this <coughs> procedural choice, because it increases the efficiency of proceedings, it allows them to make a determination uh, about how the case should be fought at the time of the proceedings rather than in advance when they cannot sensibly do so. It is very important to, to, to allow for that degree um, of procedural um, choice. Um, it's also worth saying, in relation to the matter of the choice of law in contract, that it is very important to avoid uh, some of the mistakes um, of the European regulation in this respect, the Rome 1 regulation. I won't go into detail about this because it might seem a rather parochial um, thing to say, but despite the fact that the final draft of what I recognize as Article 9 of the Rome 1 regulation was largely the product of the United Kingdom pressing for it, um, the reality is it is a dangerous thing to undermine the party's express choice of law by inserting a provision into an instrument which permits that choice to be overridden, not by reference to the mandatory rules in force in the forum, which is fair enough, but by reference to the mandatory rules in force in some third country, which is potentially damaging. And there is some evidence that it has actually affected the party's um, choice of law. But it's important to recognize that choice of law goes beyond contract. And I simply want to make this point. Although historically English law did not do that, a very positive feature, I'm now trying to be even-handed, a positive feature of the Rome II regulation um, on choice of law for non-contractual obligations is to provide explicitly for the possibility of both a contractual choice of law governing in tortious disputes and also a procedural choice in the course um, of litigation. In relation to jurisdiction agreements, if I may move on, I simply wanted to make this observation, that I think the most important thing in understanding how jurisdiction agreements work and what respect should be given to them is to understand this double life that I described a moment ago, the contractual and the procedural effect um, of jurisdiction agreements. And I would make this point. In devising any regime of rules governing jurisdiction agreements, you have to make a choice. Are you going to interpret them literally, or are you going to put them in some kind of procedural context? Is the idea merely to give effect to the literal words of an exclusive jurisdiction agreement or a non-exclusive jurisdiction agreement, which is, as it were, a contractual approach, or is it instead to use those agreements as a component in determining what the natural forum is, the forum conveniens? In English law, we don't give automatic contractual effect to jurisdiction agreements, surprisingly, because in our system, the most important consideration is determining the natural forum, which may very well be determined by a jurisdiction agreement, but not always. I should say that that doesn't mean to say that uh, you cannot rely on jurisdiction agreements in the English courts for reasons that I can 
um, I can explain perhaps um, in the questions, but it is a choice to be made. I think if I may just sum up, I think I would say this. What are the international lessons? Well, one international lesson is that the species of dispute that arise cross-border are rather different from those which arise internally. Secondly, it seems to me that the often uh, uh, expressed distinction between commercial and non-commercial contracts in particular, disputes, is perhaps uh, not as hard and fast as you might imagine, given the importance of risk assessment, even in relation to the non-commercial situation. But it does seem to me that that is the overriding point that I would make. This is not all about commercial contracts, but much of it is. And whatever you do, you have to recognize the fact that a governing law and a jurisdiction agreement has an effect. It allows the parties to assess the risk of litigation, it provides them with certainty, and it affects the price of goods and services. I'm not within time, am I? <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Um, last but not least, Pat. I'm going to do this in airplane mode, and then I'm going to set the time. All right, I'll get this out of the way. I'm not thanking anybody on the clock. Um, so uh, I'll thank you later. Uh, my subject uh, is tort and contract, which, of course, is a narrow little issue. Um, and uh, I actually sort of tromped my muddy boots through uh, Linda's area in uh, my paper. Because uh, I spent, I, I did what I do best, which is to whine about the unholy state of American uh, tort jurisdiction, uh, particularly the court's disastrous, uh, in my view, opinion in uh, the Jay McIntyre case. Uh, I, I think if that whole jury mess had a hero, it probably was Breyer, because my suspicion is that Breyer probably wanted to sign the dissent, uh, but managed to write a very narrow concurrence and drag Alito along with him, uh, depriving the plurality opinion as the status of a majority opinion, making Breyer's opinion the controlling opinion. I completely agree with Linda on uh, on on that, so uh, you know, a big part of the game in tort uh, litigation, in particular, is in my view is more about forum choice or whether you've got to actually have some place to enforce uh, whatever the tort law is that is theoretically applicable. Uh, I, I confess, and I'm, I'm going to look forward to uh, Linda's data. I, I confess to being confused about the status of the reasonableness test because uh, the only time it's come up uh, recently, unless I've missed it in the Supreme Court, unless I've missed it, is in the Daimler case where uh, Justice Sotomayor uh, wanted to concur, or she did concur in the judgment, but on the reasonableness ground and drew a kind of finger shaking rebuke from. Justice Ginsburg said, no, 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 that's only for specific jurisdiction, uh, to which I wanted to say, well, then why haven't you mentioned it since Asahi? And uh, the legal realist in me, and Matthias and I were having this discussion, is that to some extent, uh, tort choice, uh, tort conflict law in the United States uh, has been internationalized in a sense that the U.S. Supreme Court has had, by my counts, in the minimum contacts here, five chances to take jurisdiction over international defendants and has turned it down every time. So uh, in kind of a backhanded way, there is a fair amount of uh, inter internationalization uh, that has gone on already. I also talk a little bit about tour, or, sorry, contract, uh, and it turns out to be sort of tricky to comment on uh, the current draft of the restatement with regard to contract because there are no sections drafted yet. Um, uh, although a big part of me is almost tempted to say who cares uh, because, uh, in my view, the sort of over-enthusiasm for uh, party autonomy in the United States, in particular the enforcement of arbitration agreements, 
uh, and the inability of consumers uh, as a result of the agreements that they've entered into by clicking I agree on the computer or what have you um, has uh, deprived them of a class action remedy in many cases. So given the fact that sophistic, big sophisticated commercial contracts are inevitably going to include both a choice of law and a choice of forum, uh, agreement and the consumer or smaller ones will anyway, uh, the importance of choice of law rules outside of party autonomy seems to me uh, likely to be of less, uh, less import. So let me spend most of my time talking about um, the draft with regard to the tort choice of law uh, issues and uh, in a way, and this it's uh, I have to remind people that actually uh, the conflict, so-called conflicts revolution in the United States, got started with an international case, which was Babcock versus Jackson, uh, where the choice was between the New York uh, rule of ordinary care and Ontario's guest statute. Now, you may complain that Canada doesn't really count uh, because it's, you know, particular Ontario, English-speaking, common law, so much like uh, the states in the United States. But I woke up one morning to discover that my entire family is Canadian except for me. Um, it's not a joke. Uh, funny, but not a joke. Um, my wife was born in Windsor, Ontario, became a naturalized citizen uh, at age seven or something, and was forced to renounce her Canadian citizenship. Then the Canadian Supreme Court restored citizenship to everybody in her age bracket and their children. Um, so I woke up one morning and everybody wanted Tim Horton's donuts and started saying A at the end of sentences and I'm the only one who speaks French, so it seems kind of unfair, but nonetheless, uh, Canada's not part of the United States. Um, the earlier case of Auten versus Auten involved a choice involving an English rule. Um, a lot of the famous California cases, Hurtado versus Superior, uh, Superior Court comes to mind, have involved conflicts with Mexican states. For the most part, U.S. courts just have cited those interchangeably. Uh, the, you know, Babcock and and uh, Newmeyer, and then recently the Edwards case, all involved Ontario. They've all been cited interchangeably uh, with completely domestic conflicts. Uh, and so, you know, as a matter of actually restating the law, it's a little hard uh, for me to say uh, that in fact that there is any actual difference in terms of what courts do uh, in international uh, cases. Uh, I do think the biggest value um, that we could provide uh, in a restatement uh, is a fair amount of uh, certainty or predictability. Because one of the reasons, I think, uh, that the conflicts revolution didn't catch on, as Sim was talking about yesterday, uh, outside the United States was that it was wildly unpredictable um, in terms of the results. About the only thing you could say uh, is that there was uh, a very strong tendency to apply uh, forum law and pro-recovery law. Uh, and in fact, back in 1992, I wrote a terribly tedious article um, I got you beat. I had 800 cases uh, where I went through and we, comp we compared so the so-called modern methodologies to the old uh, territorial regime, and it was startling the degree to which, I, beyond what I thought, um, the, de the degree to which uh, the U.S. courts uh, tended to apply uh, forum law with the new uh, methodologies. And so it's unsurprising in some ways that it didn't um, catch on. Now, 
I did, I did, I think, play some small role uh, in terms of trying to uh, repair the second restatement's uh, reputation because as I was, if you were here yesterday in terms of the question I asked, uh, there actually are a lot of presumptive rules in the second restatement. They just get ignored. Uh, the, you, you count case after case after case that cite Section 6, cite Section 145, cite Section 188, in apparent blissful ignorance that there are actually specific sections that cover the kind of dispute. And I mentioned once one case yesterday, the Stolars case from the New York Court of Appeals, that was apparently unaware that Section 193 is there to cover insurance disputes. Um, so uh, I wrote a little article, which I thought uh, would be ignored, uh, but it wasn't, uh, on the 25th anniversary of the second restatement. And I pointed out that maybe courts want, you know, might want to buy a copy and actually look at the specific sections. Uh, and quite to my surprise, both the Illinois Supreme Court and the New Jersey Supreme Court picked up on that and started to do it. So it's pretty clear that there is some yearning out there for uh, more predictability. I myself wrote a, uh, what I thought would be a little noticed, uh, little noticed uh, article called Nebraska Choice of Law Synthesis, and I sent it out to most of the judges in Nebraska, and it essentially is an effort to restate Nebraska uh, choice of law rules. I have never gotten so many thank you notes from judges in my life, or thank you emails. Um, and in fact, I am reliably informed that uh, uh, trial courts, state trial courts uh, across the state actually don't bother much with the cases anymore. They like my article because it's got actual rules that they, they can follow. So, um, on to section, um, on to uh, the, the tort provisions here. Uh, First of all, I'd say this, I think we're off to a much better start uh, than with regard to the secondary statement because it leads off with specific rules uh, that are vastly more predictable and the escape hatch is resigned at the place where it should be, in my view, which is the end of it. Um, so that, in my view, is, is good. Uh, but... Um, I do have some specific quibbles or suggestions, uh, and as I've got a draft of my paper, the uh, reporters uh, can, you don't have to take notes, you can either get a copy of my paper, or if you don't like it, there are shredders here, I'm sure. So uh, let me point out some of the things that uh, I think probably could uh, stand to be improved. Um, one is, I, I, I profess to being a little puzzled uh, by section 6.032, uh, subpart 2, uh, which says that uh, when the relevant parties have central geographic links to different states, so we're talking about the split domicile situation, um, uh, and the conduct and the injury occur in different states, the law of the state, the conduct will presumptively govern an issue of loss allocation unless, and among the other conditions, is uh, the injured party is affiliated with the state of the injury. I, okay, I, I'm not, as, as a restatement of the rules, I, I'm not really sure that is a restatement uh, of the rule, and, and I see some practical problems with it, and one, one of them is with regard to products liability cases, because I fear what will happen is that uh, states competing for manufacturing jobs uh, will uh, make it much harder to prove uh, products liability and knowing that there are going to be a significant number of cases in which the law of the conduct, which in this case would be the, the, the design or the manufacture of the product, uh, will apply. So if you imagine, for instance, somebody buys a car in Wisconsin, which has got real, you know, reasonable products liability rules, happens to drive it 100 feet into Illinois, where you have, say, uh, a, a fuel pump uh, uh, malfunction that leads to a serious burn injury, it, the, the law would shift. I mean, you would, 
under those circumstances, presumably be going back to the state of the manufacturer just because the car happened to be driven out of, you know, into a state in which the plaintiff had no connection. I guess my question is why? Why should it change? Um, so if it were up to me, I would, uh, to avoid that problem, I would just stick with the place of the injury uh, in split affiliation cases. Uh, so there's that. Um, Section 6.03, I think, and whether this needs to be in the commentary or not, probably could stand some clarification with regard to the day passage problem. Uh, and I have in mind the Edwards versus Erie Coach case, um, in which there was something of a dispute uh, in the New York Court of Appeals as it was a big bus accident and you had the so-called trailer tractor defendants who were, I think, from Pennsylvania, and you had it was a women's hockey team from Ontario, and you, so you had Ontario defendants. Um, and the court quite uh, correctly, in my view, sort of lined them up depending on which, uh, uh, which, state, which states or provinces were involved. Uh, but there was a call in the dissent uh, to just do sort of an overall analysis, you know, to sort of throw the parties together count it all as being a split affiliation case and go with the law of the state of the injury. Um, and so I, I would, if I were drafting, I would um, explicitly side with the majority in, in Edwards and make clear that when you get these multi-party disputes that you have to line the parties up uh, uh, one by one. Otherwise, I think you're just basically going to be back to um, uh, you're basically going to be back to uh, uh, the state of the injury in almost every uh, case. Um, there's also, in my view, much too much in the conduct regulation basket. Now, I, I like the fact that the restatement draws a line between loss allocation and conduct regulation, but I, I, I think it's kind of a mistake to try to list everything that's in the conduct regulation basket. Um, and I, I profess to being baffled by some of them because, for instance, uh, uh, we have duty owed to the plaintiff, negligence, and strict liability in the conduct regulating basket, um, but we have guest statutes uh, in the loss allocation basket. Well, the only guest statute in the United States that can be found alive in the wild, uh, as far as I know, is Alabama's which raises the standard of care from you know, negligence essentially to recklessness. I used to be able to point with pride to Nebraska's guest statute, uh, but models of progressivism that we are, we actually repealed it a couple of years ago. So um, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And it also, it also brings home again the Haven State problem because, again, places, get, going back to products cases, the states trying to draw jobs are likely to uh, considerably uh, uh, reduce the chances for recovery, uh, recognizing that conduct, the, the law of the state of the conduct is going to apply uh, in, um, uh, in those cases. So uh, to me, a conduct regulating rule is one that actually directly affects primary conduct. Uh, so for instance, uh, I love England. Uh, it's just people drive on the wrong side of the road. Uh, so you need a rule. You can't have half the people driving on one side of the road. Well, you could, but I mean, you get a lot of accidents in a hurry. Um, so to me, really, the stuff that belongs in the conduct regulating side of things are either you know very obvious cases or like that or things that require at least recklessness or some kind of intent. Uh, people do build what I would call secondary conduct around loss allocating rules, like buying insurance and so on. Uh, but the degree to which, say, negligence law actually affects people's behavior to me is, is sort of doubtful. I mean, if you go back to Babcock, it seems to me incredibly unlikely that uh, Mr. Babcock crossed the line into Ontario and said, oh, good, they've got a guest statute. I'm really going to let it rip. And uh, poor Miss Jackson winds up getting hurt. Um, 
always wondered whether it, the opinion begins by saying that he crashed into a stone wall, injuring Miss Jackson. I always wondered whether that was a pun on Stonewall Jackson. But um, anyway, uh, 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 so it goes. And then finally, uh, let me just say a word or two about Section 6.07, which is the uh, is the so-called residual rule. Uh, it says, for co uh, choice of law questions not explicitly addressed in its restatement, a tort issue will be covered by the most appropriate laws to determine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you think of conduct regulation and loss allocation as exhausting tort rules, I'm not quite sure what's meant by not explicitly covered. And what worries me is that <coughs> courts will then start to look at the things that are listed <coughs> under either conduct regulation or loss allocating and uh, take that as a license to, oh, OK, it's not covered, so we get to do what we want. Um, uh, I would write something more like, uh, if the application of the rule was you know, un unforeseeable and manifestly unjust or what have you, uh, seems to me that would make for a better and less frequently used uh, safety valve rules. So I took to heart the suggestion to actually try to be as constructive as I could. It was a great discussion yesterday at, at kind of a meta level. Um, and and I think there's a lot to be learned by that. But on the other hand, uh, we got to get something down on paper. So is that my time? It is, yes. Bingo. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>
although it is certainly the case that an English court will not always give effect to an exclusive jurisdiction agreement, at least a foreign exclusive jurisdiction agreement, the reasons why they don't have over the years become associated with contract type reasoning. That's to say, uh, we will not give effect to a jurisdiction agreement if a third party would be affected. Well, that's just like saying we won't specifically inform a enforce a contractual term if a third party would be effective. Um, in the same way, um, uh, we will ignore the, the, the clause um, only in circumstances where those factors which make the English forum, the natural forum, were unforeseeable at the time that the agreement was signed up to. That, of course, is a contractual type reasoning, because what you're really saying is the term was frustrated, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I think my answer to your question is that, that, the, that, that as far as our courts are concerned, they are these issues are perceived as different. But on the other hand, they've sought to make the way that the, the clauses are handled for conflicts purposes um, and for contractual purposes as consistent as possible. Thank you. Laura. Uh, prompted by the, the jurisdiction discussion, and that is whether the uh, role of the restatement is different in a, a highly constitutionalized area, such as personal jurisdiction, rather than state common common law areas. We actually got we have personal jurisdiction on our um, our proposed table of contents. We got pushback as to whether or not we should be venturing into that area, or whether it was a good use of our our our, our time. Um, but you could also make the argument that, you know, the United States Supreme Court has left lots of gaps. We don't know what role reasonableness is supposed to play. You have the lower courts that are coming up with sort of a solution, something's workable. We could restate that. It would provide <coughs> other courts in the United States with help as well as with the rest of the world, or whether we should feel more constrained. Well, you know, the, the, you know, I went back to look, which I have to say I hadn't looked at the restatement of conflicts uh, provisions on jurisdiction for a long time. And when I looked back, I was really very surprised. And I think you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. You don't need, you know, they were stating uh, that this in the, the area of the growth of long arm statutes. And that basically that's what they were doing, looking through those provisions. So at least my advice would be not to go there. And as I said, you know, some of the things I said might have been more appropriate um, for um, the foreign relations restatement, which I really think ought to do it. But I think, I guess, I think you ought to, you need to do something. Um, and when people say pushback, I don't know whether they mean pushback from what's there. And I agree 100 percent that you really ought not to go in that direction. But. Um, uh, and, and and in one response to what. Um, Pat said the reason the Supreme Court hasn't said anything more about reasonableness in all these cases is they've decided these cases, these foreign defendant cases, on the grounds that there were no, no contacts um, at all. So in, at least in the way the Supreme Court has framed it, you don't get to the reasonableness inquiry until you find minimum contacts. That was the great, that was the dramatic change that Asahi did, which was to shift the whole framework. Um, I mean, I have to say, you know, I've been teaching, I was teaching civil procedure for 45 years, and every, you know, every few um, years there seems to be the end of an era. Um, so there was the end of quasi and rem jurisdiction that I learned and taught. Uh, then there was uh, Asahi, which changed the minimum contacts such that it doesn't violate traditional notions of fair play, substantial justice, and now there's Daimler. Um, so, you know, if you're, you're right, it's, it may be a moving target, but I think you can, in some general way, um, certainly indicate. Um, that and one other thing I think is we haven't really talked about it at all, but the Daimler case is going to um, affect I think the way you start to think about choice of law. The, the worst and the most extreme choice of law cases in some ways are the old general jurisdiction cases where you, know, you look at all of the constitutional uh, limitations on choice of law. Every single one of those cases, all state shots and so on, they're all cases of general jurisdiction. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, choice of law is not going to be important or the choice of or, or forum shopping for choice of law rules, but it, it really is going to, going to, uh, I think, dramatically affect what those choices, what those choices are. Um, 
it. So I guess you know the short answer is I think you ought to do something, and we could do some of this, I think, by way of reporter's notes. And I think the restatement of foreign relations in saying um, there's state long-arm statutes and there's due process has really sold things short, and maybe the two groups can get together and do something that um, gives a little bit more guidance. If I just say a couple of words on that. Uh, it's true, of course, that the foreign defendant cases have been decided on lack of context, but not every justice has said that. And so uh, when Justice Ginsburg and Jay McIntyre opined that there were minimum contacts, uh, it seems to me that if she thought there were still a reasonableness test, that she would have to go into that and get uh, get past that. Uh, but she didn't, and then shortly thereafter, in Daimler, delivers what I call the finger shaking rebuke, the Sotomayor, which is no, 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 that's just in specific jurisdiction. So why didn't she take her, her own advice? Um, the and I know it's a case that gets overlooked as well, but there were four justices in Burnham who actually conducted a minimum contacts analysis, albeit a wildly implausible one, uh, to find that there was jurisdiction and there wasn't any mention of the reasonableness test there either. So I, I just, you know, I just don't know what to do with it. Uh, I don't know whether it's really there or not, it certainly is true that a lot of lower courts uh, respond to it. As far as, far as uh, what you can do in the second restatement, I mean, unfortunately to me, jurisdiction is the biggest problem and it's the thing you can do the least about other than getting yourself appointed to the Supreme Court. So uh, uh, you're probably gonna have to say something on it. I, I can, and maybe, Linda, you remember, uh, more than, I can remember only one minimum context era case that ever cited the secondary statement on jurisdiction, and I, I think that was Colco. Uh, I think it was Colco, and and Marshall said, quoted the secondary statement provision, and said, "Well, that's cute, but it's not binding on us," and that was the end of that. So, uh, I, I think your goal should be modest uh, with regard to. Uh, with with regard to uh, uh, personal jurisdiction, and I mean, to the extent that there's you know important data now out there about what lower courts are doing with the reasonable stats, yeah, I think it makes some sense to try to restate that. So, you know, even if the Supreme Court ignores it, and lower courts aren't ignoring it. That we kind of know what to do with it. I that that to me seems like a perfectly sensible suggestion. I have Matthias then Horatia. support for dealing with jurisdiction, even you know, particularly after Daimler, because it is a total game changer with regard to the constitutional limitations on jurisdiction. As Linda said, all the Hyde cases came out of general and personal jurisdiction cases, and that's no accident because the case is lodged in a form that has nothing else to do with litigation, not even the home of the defendant. And that raises the choice of law question, and that pushed the court so close to the limit in all states. If you take these cases out, and continue to apply the all-state standard, it is almost impossible to imagine a case that would run afoul of any constitutional limitations. And so, in the post-Daimler area, we'll also have to rethink, from a post-Daimler perspective, the constitutional limitations question, because um, all-state is becoming, in a sense, uh, a museum of legal history. And so, if you want to make a sensible uh, restatement of constitutional limitations, you know, barking up that wrong tree is kind of a goner. <laughs> That's part of the reason why you have, it will loop back to general persona of jurisdiction, whether you like it or not. And to bring it to the back door, the constitutional limitation seems odd to me. It's better to face take the bull by the horns and, and deal with it and then extrapolate from it and saying, here, here's the impact that it will have. Arisha, then Ralph. Okay, may I ask a question about uh, choice of law in contract? And it's probably for Richard, but I'd like to. Um, know what the uh, restatement reporters uh, think about this. So uh, Richard talked about the law of utopia, and so I'm taking him literally. What do you do about parties choosing something that's not state law, right? So 
whether it's uni droit principles or the lex mandatoria or the rules of monopoly or whatever, or the law of utopia, uh, what do you think about that? And um, if there's no particular reason to, which I think, uh, to distinguish between choosing between some totally unrelated, um, <coughs> the law of some totally unrelated jurisdiction and the rules of monopoly or whatever, don't you think that some kind of provision on mandatory rules, including foreign mandatory rules, isn't useful? So I could, yes, well, you, she asked, um, she asked you. Well, <laughs> well, I know of Utopia, but... Well, I, I mean, as to the first of those, I mean, I, mean, I think that, that, that... I mean, it seems to me, in principle, you can choose any uh, provable body of norms to govern your contract, but... But I mean, the clue lies in what I've just said. I mean, I mean, I mean, it has to be something which can be, which can be discerned. I mean, that's why, of course, you know, Sharia law is identifiable. You know, you can, you can, you can get expert evidence. It seems to me that isn't a, isn't a, isn't a problem particularly, um, uh, from a conceptual point of view. I mean, uh, I think on the question of mandatory rules, I mean, I mean, you did, of course, pick up on my point about Article, Article Nine. I mean, I think it really all goes to the well, the question of certainty and predictability. This is what it is all about. I mean, this, this is what party autonomy is all about. Um, it, if I can explain the difficulty which I was, um, I was referring to, um, there is a rule in the um, in the Rome One regulation which says that a court may, and that by itself is quite troubling. Actually, I come from the home of discretion, but the word "may" is a problem here. A court may not give effect to the law that governs the court, <coughs> that which expressly governs it, um, <coughs> if it considers. Um, bearing in mind the consequences of so holding, um, that it should give effect to some law of a state which uh, which um, renders performance of a contract illegal. I mean, that might sort of, you know, sort of a broad court brush. It, yes, yeah. But the difficulty with that, um, and the one I particularly had in mind, was this, that the way that, that particular provision is drafted uh, suggests that both illegality at the time the contract is made and supervening illegality um, are subject to that rule. But of course, there's a huge difference between those things. I mean, it's fair enough to say that if you and I make a contract to be performed in dystopia and we know it's illegal or one of us does, that it shouldn't be enforced. But to say that we make a contract to be performed in dystopia, which is legal at the time of creation, but it becomes illegal, that's a different thing. To me, that is a matter essentially of discharge of the contract by frustration, and therefore it should be governed by the law applicable to the contract. And I think the fact that it isn't is the problem when it comes to the commercial context of Article 9. So, so I suppose what I'm saying, I mean, I, I have to be fairly specific in saying that, I, I mean, it's not, it's not just to do with the effects of giving effect to, to of, of the mandatory rules in force in the place of performance. It's more the way that that is done in Article 9, which I think is the problem. Can I just, um, since I didn't get to say anything about party autonomy, and I would like to take it back to the Restatement 187, which will, I assume, occupy uh, the reporters um, for a while. Um, and so before one even gets to non-state norms, which I agree might be an issue, I, I'd like to, I mean, I think there are other limitations in the international contract area that ought to be eliminated. Um, so the first thing that I suggested that you would eliminate the requirement of a su substantial relation, at least in the international contract. Now, I see Sim shaking his head. I mean, he got rid of it for both domestic and interstate cases in Louisiana and in Oregon. But at minimum, it does seem to me that you ought to get rid of it in um, the international case. And I think you, know, you, could, you could say that the notion that, that's now in there that says it's reasonable um, could be you know, used to say, oh, yes, it's reasonable in the international case. I think you'd be better off to just draw the distinction between the international uh, contract uh, and just abandon it. Um, in that in that context, even if you decide to leave it, um, you know, moving, if you will, in a half step um, from what was before. Also, I think, to pick up on something Richard said, I do think you should distinguish international commercial contracts from other kinds uh, of contracts. Um, and, you know, there is something to be gained from the Hague principles that have come out to look at this. Um, they do that. Of course, the regulation has special rules with respect to passengers, consumers, employees, and insurance policyholders. And I, at least I don't know the cases as well as you, but I, 
with respect to insurance policyholders, those are um, international, uh, could be international cases. Um, and generally, as you know, here we don't single out weaker parties. So I, I think one could draw again that distinction by talking about international commercial contracts and allowing greater party autonomy. Now, I know that that this was tried um, in 2001 when they tried to revise uh, the UCC, and they did it, and it failed. Um, so what then do you do? I, I just wondered if one looked at case law in various jurisdictions, you know, maybe you could find support when you're looking at the way the restatement is applied and when they, use, when they apply the basic rule that says uh, a party's choice will not be given effect um, if it would be contrary to a fundamental policy of a state which has a material or greater interest, and that is the, the law applicable. And that's the way we deal with, I, I'm not going to get into the discussion of the relationship between fundamental policy and overriding mandatory rules, because I don't think I understand overriding mandatory rules sufficiently. Some people tell me it's an absolute category that where there's no balancing. I had a wonderful discussion with Horacio last night over dinner who said, no, uh, it can be balanced, but we we use the term fundamental policy. I think we probably ought to try to give um, more guidance about what we mean and what's in the present restatement. And finally, um, you know, it, the language is the law of the state which has a materially greater interest than the chosen state, and which would otherwise be the state of applicable law. And I ran across a very interesting California uh, case in which there's a concurring judge who says it's a conflict between the chosen law, Hong Kong law, and California law. And the concurring judge says, I don't have to get to the question of whether or not that there's a fundamental policy of California. Because when we talk about material or greater interest, California has double interest. They have the interest in their substantive rule, whatever it happens to be. And they have an interest, he says, in party autonomy and contracts. But in particular, he says, when it's, uh, when it's an international contract. And I think putting all of this together, one could draft a, this is one provision where I think one could really draft a provision that did draw the distinction that Rolf has been talking about and all of us are struggling to find, to, to sort of think about the international, uh, the cross-border case differently uh, than the domestic case. So it's, that's just a suggestion. I mean, 187 has been, is probably, you know, maybe the most cited provision, um, even New York, which actually has its own, I don't know if, you, if everyone knows, New York has its own general obligations law, which says if you choose New York law and you're in a New York court, you get New York. There's no, nothing. Nothing limits anything. There's no overriding mandatory anything. There's no relationship. If you want New York, you get New York. And uh, There's enough money involved. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Uh, it has to be. Uh, it has to be a million. Well, it only has to be. No, it doesn't have to be uh, a million dollars for the choice of law. It, but you need a million dollars to get a New York court. And the only way you can be sure that this provision will be enforced is to have a million dollars. I think it's two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for if you just want New York law. But nobody else is going to enforce it. But New York, when it has to consider. Uh, the application of uh, some other state's law. In fact, there's a wonderful case um, where New York, uh, th th there are two parties. One of them has Delaware law, one has New York law. New York, law, New York says, we enforce New York law qua New York law, no, no limitation whatsoever. As to the application of Delaware law, and P.S., Delaware has a provision very similar to New York's. What? Yeah, the cheaper. Yeah, right. But, but, and if you're in Delaware, they'll do it. But New York says, no, sorry, Delaware law um, uh, contravenes the sort of um, uh, the fundamental policy of the otherwise applicable law. So they apply sort of New York law, and then they apply the foreign law, um, or the other law um, in, this, uh, in this case. Ralph and Simi. Yeah, so I have a complex question that's slightly orthogonal, and I think it's probably mainly for Linda and Pat, um, but it's also brought up, and it's um, 
related to what Trey yesterday called the difference between big and small conflicts. Now, model cases tend to be the small conflicts, right? So Richard spoke of the consumer contract that we focus on disproportionately, although it doesn't matter very much in tort. We focus a lot on car accidents. <laughs> and the big cases are really fundamentally different in many ways, right? And, and one broad question is, should the restatement account for that? So um, the most important difference may be that the big cases concern corporate actors and not natural persons, right? We, we treat conflict of laws still in very many ways as conflicts between natural persons. We speak of fairness as though corporations were owed fairness in the same way in which natural persons are. If we look at um, a lot of the case law jurisdiction, the, the big cases are also cases about corporate structure, right? So Goodyear and Daimler concern very much the way in which the corporation is set up, the multinational corporation is set up. De Castro is very much a case about distribution schemes and a corporation making quite sure that it has no corporate relations into the United States. So there's a whole corporate structure behind that that determines questions of jurisdiction. It seems to me that the courts not only don't address that fact that corporations are different in that way, but even go further and say corporations, really what we look for is the home of the corporation. So they completely go all the way to equate the corporation in the end um, to a natural person. The restatement at the moment in its section 209 struggles, I think, and understandably so very much with the question, what's the best connecting factor for a corporation? In the end, I think, settles to say that has to be determined in light of the conflicts rule that we're dealing with, which is a kind of internal restatement envoi, right? The, the, the specific rule says we have to look for domicile, and the domicile provision says but what's domicile really can only be determined in view of the, of the tort rule. I wonder what you think what the restatement should, whether that is an issue, whether we should treat that development seriously, and how a restatement could actually respond to that. You want me to go? Why not? All right. <laughs> well, I enjoyed every minute of that. Um, I, I'm... I'm not sure I've got any good answers for you. Uh, it, I think you're clearly right. The, the court has gone out of its way to, well, particularly in Daimler and Goodyear, to avoid deciding the case on the deg the degree to which contacts can be imputed, and in, that's an issue that I. It, as far as I know, maybe Linda remembers another case. I mean, the 1925 Cannon case, it's not even clear whether that's a constitutional case or not. So I, I, I do think it would be worthwhile to try to give some guidance to lower courts uh, with regard to corporate structure, uh, because in, in, in my view, the Ninth Circuit's imputation of uh, an indirect subsidy, uh, indirect subsidiaries contacts to the parent corporation was just was kind of crazy. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, yeah, it's nuts, uh, but they don't really tell us what wouldn't be nuts and proceeded then to go on with the long dictum about, uh, uh, you know, about corporate home and so on. So, I, I do think that's an issue that's that's well worth taking up, and I, I do agree with you that, you know, still the, I mean, I don't know, I got a case book on it, and we got a whole lot of car accident cases in there, and uh, and that maybe really big cases like the Agent Orange litigation or what have you ought to, ought to be thought of differently. I mean, Ralph, I hear your question somewhat broader than the jurisdictional question. I. I, you know, I think it'd be perfectly as difficult as Pat says it is. I think you can try to find some lines about um, subsidiaries in the jurisdiction area. Um, I think the court makes it quite clear that somebody that might be an agent for a specific jurisdiction might not be an agent for general jurisdiction. Um, so you know that line I think can be drawn. A much harder question, and you know I think you really have me stumped. Um, is when you're going to try to define the corporation for for choice of law purposes or whatever other purposes you're trying 
to do. I don't know, um, you know, this notion of geographical link. I, I don't know um, that that gives the kind of certainty and specificity that one is sort of looking for when one is, you know, you, you've done, they've done a very good job of trying to move to, to rules. And then when you start to open up the criteria of what the links are, um, I mean, maybe that's the, the much harder question. If I can just sort of briefly answer as well. I mean, I think it, it's interesting, actually, because I think, I think in the UK, we've almost moved away from seeing a subject called the conflict of laws or private international law. I think we recognize that there is a generic set of rules which provide the toolkit which you then use in very specific sort of sectors, international commercial litigation, cross-border torts, international family law, and so on. So I think we increasingly see it in reality as being about different broadly defined fact situations, but there are these general principles that feed into it. Um, I would say one thing, though. I think the general principles are important. Um, I mean, I was struck by the fact that yesterday Horatio mentioned a case, the Iraqi civilians in the Ministry of Defense. Um, now, I mean, a um, a veil should be put over the decision in that in that in that case as we were discussing last night. But what was interesting about it is, and I won't go into the into the facts, is that it was the classic conflicts case in one sense, in that the Supreme Court uh, was treated to a lengthy exposition about the fundamental principles governing the distinction between substance and procedure, characterization, the proof of foreign law, and public policy. So I think the point I'm making is that I think it's, it's useful to see it as a toolkit, but the toolkit is actually still very important. The general principles are important. But equally, I think it's important to focus on the context in which the subject operates. Right. Simeon, then Matthias. What I already asked about, um, as you know, there was a big debate about that at the Hague conference, and there were the delegations that wanted that very much. And we're talking outside arbitration, where it was always permitted. And the delegations that didn't want it at all, and that was on that, I was on that side. And in the end, we reached a compromise, which we put some safeguards about what kind of non-state norms can be chosen um, uh, in the context of litigation as opposed to arbitration. And, uh, and if we are to deal with that in this restatement, I would suggest that at a minimum we put these safeguards, namely, it have to be they have to be fair and balanced and and complete and uh, and so on, uh, because in this country, unlike Europe, where you have you know some very well uh, non-state, uh, very well done non-state norms like the London Commission and all of that. In this country, when we're talking about non-state norms, we include credit card association rules and, right. and all of those industry groups which have their own rules and it would be very dangerous to allow that kind of a choice of law clause to include those norms. So uh, if I, I think the cleanest solution would be to leave that aside, but if you are going to confront it head on, you better put the safeguards that would at least behave principles. Uh, now, coming to 187, it is true that it is the most widely followed section of the restatement uh, second, and that includes not only New York, but also California, and several other states that follow approaches other than the, that the restatement itself. But it even includes states like uh, Alabama, which still follows the electoral right. rule. So in that sense, it is the most successful section of the restatement. But, uh, that doesn't mean that one section like that, as good as it might have been for its time, can do the job. One thing we learn uh, from recent experience is that, uh, that different types of contracts need different type of policing with regard to party autonomy and the limits of party autonomy and so on. And so uh, there we can learn from the Europeans uh, uh, where, and I now mean the EU, um, where they have different limitations and different criteria for consumer and employment contracts on the one hand, passengers and insurers on the other, and then every everybody else. So different limitations. Uh, now, they, they, they are people who fall between the cracks, like franchisees and so on, and so we can do better. But the one size fits all uh, solution of 187 no longer works. And, and Linda is right that they tried with the UCC to, to do something similar, 
Um, uh, and, and of course, we know what happened to that provision along the Virgin Islands. But that was a political process. We had to go through the legislatures of the various states. Uh, hopefully, we're in a better, less political or less partisan environment at, at the uh, ALI, and therefore, something like that uh, could work. One thing that we do better in this country than they do elsewhere is the question of which state's limitation should be used as the, as the instrument for policing party autonomy. <laughs> there, under the restatement, that's a very good part of 187, is that it is the fundamental policy uh, of the state whose law would otherwise govern. That should be used as the limitation, not the public policy of the Lex 4 I as such, which is what they do in the rest of the world, and that can lead to some very deadly combinations of choice of form and choice of law clauses. That, uh, that, uh, that is something we shouldn't... Um, we shouldn't. Uh, uh, now, on the substantial relationship uh, requirement, I think uh, Linda is right. We don't need to cover. And in fact, the codifications of the most of the codifications of the recent years have abandoned that requirement because you can police part the autonomy more substantively rather than geographically. And looking at the case law in this country, uh, I think there are only about nine cases uh, in the last. 40 years or so, they are all in one footnote in in Hay Borcher's Simeonidis book, <laughs> where the book, where the court struck down a church of law clause for that reason. But if you look the record, if you look at the record, there are really a lot of other reasons. There's something wrong in that contract anyway. So you don't need that requirement. And the the other reasonable basis that is still in in Section 7 is a very good one, and that is how we get around to allow people to choose. English law in all the insurance cases, for example, and all the other cases, because there is a reasonable basis to choose English law because of its maturity and completeness, and that's why you get all that. That's how you get all that business, uh, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all. Thank you, uh, Matthias. In the interest of time, I will forego the question. Well, we've got seven minutes left. Oh, yeah, the seven. only person on the queue. So. Um, I think Ralph raises an important point, and I think goes sort of to the fundamentals of how to approach this restatement. It, it depends on how much you want to put on a realist head and how much you want to put in a doctrinalist head. If you take on a radical realist view, it's like, you know, as Patrick suggested, you could make a rule and say in general jurisdiction, foreign corporations can no longer be sued in U.S. courts. But that's a, as, as a sort of overstated caricature realist rule, that's what you get out of the last couple of Supreme Court cases. I mean, you can't do that because, as we know from Linda, that's not really true, right? If you take on a doctrinalist view, you say the Supreme Court has never said that corporations are going to be treated radically differently from individuals. It both turns on domicile, and just corporations can have one, and individuals can, you can have two, and individuals can have one. I think you need to find a middle ground somewhere in between, and that's difficult, because on the one hand, you want to piece short of doctrine and want to present a restatement that's doctrinally coherent and sound. On the other hand, you have to be realistic in the sense of the old realist uh, paradigm that you know, law is what the courts do in fact. And, and so that, that middle ground will be hard to find, but I think it's important to struggle <coughs> with that question. So the rules you state are not doctrinal rules, nor can they be completely just rules of result. Right? They've got to be something in the middle. And so that's not a, 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 an answer to Ralph's question, but I think that's that what makes the, the job of restating this particularly difficult. Thank you. Um, I'm not <coughs> asking a question. I'm, I'm, I'm answering one because I'm very conscious I didn't answer the second of the questions that you, that you no. put me. But, but, but um, um, I think it is interesting. And the question, as I understood it, was um, to what extent in a third restatement is it necessary to address what you might call the... the, the Tension or sort of parallelism between the contractual and the and the uh, um, and the private international law um, aspect, especially of jurisdiction agreements. Well, I could give you a long list actually of issues that might arise, but I mean, let me just give you the sort of the executive summary. I mean, there are questions like this: if you're faced with an exclusive jurisdiction agreement in favour of the courts of utopia, do you simply say, "Well, the parties have agreed to the exclusive jurisdiction of the courts of utopia, therefore there is no possibility"? Uh, of any proceedings being heard here, which is, so to speak, a contractual view? Uh, or do you take the view that the English courts would, which is to say, well, the starting point is that this is a contractual clause and we should respect it, but nonetheless, the question that we're being asked is whether we should exercise jurisdiction. That is a procedural issue. 
And therefore, we ask a different set of questions. The overriding issue is whether we are the natural forum. I mean, that's a different way of looking at it. That's, as it were, the, the private international law perspective. And as I indicated earlier, you can actually marry the two by making sure that your search for the natural forum respects the contractual meaning of the clause. Equally, you can ask yourself the question, um, is, it, is it necessary to make explicit the fact that you can, um, as it were, specifically perform, you can specifically enforce a jurisdiction agreement by means of an anti-suit injunction? Because one of the most powerful ways in which English jurisdiction agreements are enforced is that our courts will invariably, without blinking, grant injunctions to prevent foreign proceedings which are in breach of that, 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 um, that clause. Um, I mean, that's important, of course, because that's taking a contractual view in opposition to what you might call a more international law view, which would regard comity as being the key thing. Mm. In the same way, and this, this is just the last on my, on my shopping list, which could go on forever. Um, I mean, English law has a, has a very useful feature, is that, which is that an English judge is prohibited, actually prohibited by statute, from giving effect to a foreign judgment uh, which is given in conflict with an exclusive jurisdiction agreement. Um, now, what's interesting about that uh, is that that statutory provision makes it absolutely explicit, not only that the court must protect the agreement in that way, but that it must ignore any findings made in the foreign court. For example, we ignore the fact that the foreign court came to a legitimate conclusion that the governing law of the clause was in fact not English law, it was the law of dystopia, and it's not a valid clause under the law of dystopia. Now that's interesting, because that's giving effect to actually a contractual view. This is, this is a contractual term, we have to give effect to it. Despite the fact that the private international law view would say, Principles of raised judicata, principles of comity. I mean, those are the kinds of issues that I think I, I would I would have mm -hmm. in mind. I, if I can, I just have one, I think, little point. But I, we were talking about the role of the, you know, the cross-border case versus domestic case, and the reporters have in 104 said basically maybe that, you know, in particular cases they might be willing or it might be appropriate to treat them differently and sort of overall they're the same. Um, and, I, you know, I look back um, because that, that line was also in Section 10 of the earlier restatement. And if you think about it abstractly, it seems very open, particularly open to the argument that I was just putting about a liberal standard for party autonomy. But if you read the comment and reporter's notes to section 10, it goes in exactly the opposite direction. And it says, uh, a US court might be more reluctant to apply the local law of a foreign nation with standards and ideals different from ours than it would be to apply to the local law of a sister state. Now, that I think, you know, I don't know whether it was right when they did it in 71. I think it's in some ways, it's clearly not right now, at least if you're talking about the sort of commercial contract case that I was giving as an example. And I say that even though, and you know, maybe this will be discussed in the next section uh, a little bit, we've now got those foreign law bans. And I don't know what the reporters think they ought to do with them. For purposes of the argument I made about the international commercial contract, I will note that the foreign law bans uh, many of them have express uh, exceptions for corporations uh, and other legal entities to make sure that whatever this interferes with, it doesn't interfere with the international commercial contract. But uh, I, I, I commend 104, just get rid of all those old uh, notes and comments and figure out how, how you should deal with it. Uh, and if what you're going to do with those foreign law bans as a restatement. Wonderful. Um, I think we're out of time. So join me in please thanking our panelists.